Hey, buddy. It's all good. Yeah, he heard us coming. Welcome to episode 12 of my 2022 training diaries. This week was my last big week of training before I begin to taper and lead up to my first race of the year in the country of Georgia. And this week I also saw my first black bear of the season, which is always exciting. Encounters like this are quite common here in BC, starting in around April when bears come out of hibernation. Although technically they're not true hibernators. But depending on where you live, you may have begun to see bears on the trails as well. Now typically bears don't want anything to do with humans, but there are some things that you can do to avoid potentially dangerous encounters with bears and other wildlife, which I'll briefly talk about later in this video. I'll also talk a little bit about the neighborhood here where I live and give you a tour of the waterfront just outside my apartment here. But first, let's talk about how this past week of training went, which turned out to be my biggest of the season yet in terms of both distance and elevation. Although I did have to move a few things around to deal with a work conflict, which is why this video is a little bit late. So Monday was a rest day, followed on Tuesday by an easy run of about 75 minutes on the trails with my usual Tuesday night trail group here on the North Shore. Wednesday, I then did a strength training session at the gym with my personal trainer. And this is the only session I did this week, having recently dropped down from two sessions per week to just one as my race approaches. I also had a tempo run scheduled for Wednesday, but at this point, I decided to push the rest of my schedule out by a day because I was gonna be on call for some filming on Saturday, which would get in the way of the back-to-back -back long runs that I had scheduled for the weekend. So instead, I did my tempo workout on Thursday, and this I ran on mostly crushed gravel along Fisherman's Trail here in the Seymour River Valley. After a 20 minute warm up, I ran two sets of 10 minutes at an eight RPE, meaning I could only speak in a short sentence at a time, followed by five minutes of easy running at around four RPE. Check back to episode seven, where I discussed the RPE scale in case you missed it. I then did four sets of four minutes at 10 RPE, which is an all out effort with three minutes of easy running in between each, along with a 12 minute cool down on the way home. Friday, I then did an easy run of about 60 minutes on the trails. Again, this I originally had scheduled for a Thursday, but I just moved everything over by a day. And for my shorter runs this week, I've been testing a new watch from Koros, the Apex Pro, which is much lighter and much more comfortable than my Koros Vertex 2 for these kind of shorter runs. So stay tuned for a review in the near future. Saturday was the day that I was on call for work, but I was able to squeeze in the 45 minutes of cross training that I had on the schedule for the Friday, which I did on the stationary bike here at the gym in our building. Sunday was then the first of my back-to-back -back long runs for the week. I had seven hours on the schedule with a fully loaded pack, but I was looking to include a bit more elevation change than I have been recently as well, as I begin to bank some training towards UTMB. So I headed out to Squamish to my good friend Adam's house, which I used as a home base. I started with a short loop with Adam and his dog Cooper on some fairly technical trails. Adam is racing the Western States 100 miler in a few weeks, so be sure to keep a lookout for the name Adam Harris if you're planning on following along with that race. We dropped off the dog back at Adam's place and were then joined by our buddy Wing for the next big loop. You might remember Wing from a couple of episodes ago, as well as from my film about the Vancouver 100, an annual event that takes place on the North Shore. I'll link to that video in the description in case you missed it. And Wing is gonna be running that again next week as he trains for the Fat Dog 120 miler. Hey buddy. It's all good. Yeah, he heard us coming. What's well, nothing to do with us? After one last stop at Adams to refill my bottles, I set out for a third loop on my own for the last two hours or so. My pack weight fluctuated between about 10 to 13 pounds in between water refills. If you wanna get a better look at the beautiful trails around Squamish, I'll include a link in the description to a video that I filmed there with Adam and our other friend Jeff last summer as well. So in the end, this run was 61 kilometers or 38 miles with 1,825 meters of elevation gain or roughly 6,000 feet plus equal descent. 
Monday, I woke up feeling pretty stiff as expected. So I ran a warm bath followed by some foam rolling and mobility work. And this really has become my secret weapon for these back-to-back -back long runs, and I cannot recommend it highly enough. And it's mostly the heat from the bath that really helps to get the blood flowing, but the foam rolling helps as well. I then went out for the second in my back-to-back -back long runs, which I'd originally had scheduled for four hours for Sunday. And given how much elevation change I'd covered the day before, I decided to run around the city so that I could keep it flat and runnable. I set out from my house here on the Tsleil-Waututh Nation Reserve in North Vancouver along the Spirit Trail. This is a really nice paved route that contours a huge stretch of the waterfront along the North Shore through the Squamish Nation's Hamulchison Reserve at the foot of the Capilano River. I crossed the Lionsgate Bridge to Stanley Park to continue along the seawall where I sometimes go to do my speed work, which is pretty stunning as far as paved routes go and it's not uncommon to catch a glimpse of whales right from the seawall itself, including the orca or killer whale. All I managed to see was a number of container and tanker ships though. seawall along the waterfront on the south side of the Burrard Inlet, all the way through East Vancouver and across the Second Narrows Bridge to close the loop back to my home in North Vancouver. After running 40 kilometers or roughly 25 miles in four hours on feet. So in total for the past seven days from Tuesday to yesterday on Monday, I ran just shy of 138 kilometers or close to 86 miles with just under 2,900 meters of elevation gain or roughly 9,500 feet plus equal descent. As I said, I actually live on the Tsleil-Waututh Nation Reserve near Deep Cove on land that's leased from and was developed in partnership with the First Nation. The Tsleil-Waututh Nation is just one of many groups of Coast Salish peoples who have lived in the area for thousands of years, long before European settlers arrived. In fact, all of Vancouver is located on the traditional and unceded territory of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh Nations, meaning it was never legally ceded or given up through a treaty or other agreement. The Tsleil-Waututh people hold a deeply rooted and sacred relationship with the orca whale, whose populations are in decline. And we'll have to see what the expansion of the Trans Mountain Pipeline could mean for the orcas in the region, as we see a potential seven-fold increase in tanker traffic to the refinery in Burnaby, right across the inlet from the Tsleil-Waututh First Nation Reserve. We're so lucky here in British Columbia to live so close to nature. Audrey and I live literally 500 meters from the ocean in one direction and less than two kilometers from the foot of Mount Seymour in the other. Growing up, I did a lot of sailing and had many extremely close encounters with whales and other marine wildlife. And now I regularly encounter wildlife like deer, goats, and bears while on the trails. But avoiding potentially dangerous conflicts with bears in particular is as much about their safety as our own, especially when it comes to food storage when camping. Here on the North Shore, we only have black bears, but grizzly bears, which are a much less common but potentially more dangerous species of bear here in North America, do exist in some areas of Squamish, as well as Chilliwack, and a few other areas where we'd spend quite a bit of time running. I actually produced a fairly detailed documentary about bear safety that I published around this time last year, where I talked about how to tell the difference between the two types of bears, as well as what to do if you encounter one in the wild. But I really just want to highlight a few important points here today. Now, I personally never bother carrying bear spray when I run in black bear territory, but I always do when in known grizzly habitat. Of course, this requires that you do some research first to understand what types of wildlife you might encounter in a given area. Now, there's no harm in carrying bear spray with you all the time, but the key is to keep it handy and to know how to use it. There's no use in carrying bear spray if you've got it packed away. 
So with that in mind, and given the relatively low risk of an attack by a black bear, I personally am quite comfortable spending so much time here on the trails, particularly in North Vancouver, without carrying bear spray. And what doesn't seem to work as well as carrying a bear bell. Human sounding sounds, and specifically the human voice, are much more effective. Bears really want nothing to do with us. Now there have been isolated cases of bears being predatory and hunting humans, but this is extremely rare, especially when it comes to black bears. So the best way to avoid conflicts with bears is to run in groups and to make plenty of noise in order to warn them that you're coming and to give them time to run away. The bear that we encountered this weekend was already well on his way by the time that we spotted him, and that was just thanks to us having a regular conversation as we ran. You're simply trying to avoid sneaking up on a bear, especially on trails where visibility is limited, which could cause it to act defensively. So when I am running alone, I'll occasionally yell out as I approach a blind corner or after passing by a noisy stream. I'll link to my documentary on bear safety below in case you want to learn more about these incredible animals and what you can do to keep both them and yourself comfortable and safe. So this week it's finally time to taper, meaning that I'll be dropping the volume of my training significantly while keeping up the intensity. It's also time to make some final decisions on a few things for my upcoming race, including which shoes I'm going to wear and my nutrition. So I'll tell you all about that next week. And stay tuned as well for a new film that I finally finished about a four day backcountry ski trip that we took last year to McGillivray Lodge, a few hours north of here. As always, if you found this video helpful, give it a like and be sure to subscribe for more videos like this.